Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering part two of depression. Uh, just the FYI, guys, I am filming from home, so if you hear the kids, pretend like you don't. All right, let's get started. So um, make sure you watch part one of depression before you watch this part. If you haven't, go back, watch part one, then come back and watch this, which is part two. So with part two, this is where we ended, and this is where... Um, we ended with this in part one. We're going to start here, part two, implementation. So look what it says. It says, should I make this bigger for you? Let me make this bigger. There we go. It says there are three major phases in treatment and recovery from major depression. Now, guys, something you need to keep in mind, don't forget depression is anger, hostility, resentment, turns who? Turn towards who? Themselves. Okay. The acute phase is six to 12 weeks. It's directed at reduction of depressive symptoms and restorations of psychosocial and work function. It's directed towards getting that patient symptomatically to start to feel better, have enough energy to go back to work and perform just their activities of daily living. But let me tell you something. That is the most dangerous time. You have to be very careful because as the, the symptoms start to lift and you know the patient starts to have more energy, guess what? They may have just enough energy to go ahead and finish off their plan that they had to kill themselves. They have the energy to follow up with that plan. So you have to watch and monitor that patient very closely, okay? if they're inpatient. Now, the continuation phase, this is four to um, nine months. It's directed at prevention of a relapse through pharmacotherapy, education, and depression-specific psychotherapy. And the last one is the maintenance phase. That's one year or more, and that's directed at prevention of further episodes of depression. So make sure you guys are aware of those three phases in treatment and recovery for major depression. By the way, guys, if you feel like I'm going too fast, just pause. You guys can pause. You guys can rewind. It's up on YouTube for you. <clears throat> now, look this up for you. If you take a look here on table 14 2, it says symptoms, uh, signs and symptoms, there's some diagnoses and outcomes for depression. What I want to focus on, guys, are the signs and symptoms and the company nursing diagnoses. You need to understand what they are and why we're using them. So let's start with the signs and symptoms of, I don't know why I don't have this highlighted, but it's very important, previous suicidal attempts. Any patient who has attempted suicide before, they're at high, high, high risk for another attempt putting affairs in order. All of a sudden, they wanna have a will, right? Uh, people, family members that they were estranged with, they wanna make amends. they're putting their affairs in order, giving away prized possessions. When it comes to NCLEX, we usually see this as a question and it's related to an adolescent or teenager, a high schooler that is giving away their favorite necklace or uh, clothing or whatever it is that's important to them. And the list goes on. You guys can read that on your own. But when it comes to these signs and symptoms, your nursing diagnosis is going to be risk for self-directed violence, risk for suicide. You're going to be concerned about them harming or injuring themselves. Look at the this difficulty with simple tasks, inability to function at their previous level. Poor problem solving, poor cognitive function. What does the word cognition mean to think? So they're having problems just thinking clearly, right? The nursing diagnosis is going to be ineffective coping. How about having a dull or sad affect? Not making eye contact. Having a preoccupation with their own thoughts. Wanting to be by themselves all the time. Being withdrawn, not communicating. Your nursing diagnosis is going to be social isolation. Feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, powerlessness. Your nursing diagnosis would be something like hopelessness or powerlessness. 
How about them questioning the meaning of life and existence or anger towards a greater power or them being upset with God, them feeling abandoned, nursing diagnosis, spiritual distress. It's kind of blurry. Let me see if I can make it easier to see for you. No. Exaggerates negative feedback about self, excessive seeking of reassurance, them feeling good, them, be, them feeling guilt, excuse me, them being indecisive, non-assertive, having poor eye contact, feeling shame. You could have a nursing diagnosis of chronic low self-esteem. Vegetative signs of depression. That vegetative signs of depression, guys, that's when that patient is so depressed they won't even move. Forget getting up to brush your teeth or take a shower. Grooming and hygiene deficiencies. They're not getting up to brush your teeth or take a shower. They're not putting on deodorant. Significantly reduced appetite, changes in sleeping or eating, elimination, um, sexual patterns. Now with those types of signs and symptoms, guys, there are a couple of nursing diagnoses you can have for that, such as self-care deficit, them not brushing their teeth or bathing, insomnia, them not sleeping. And remember guys, when it comes to physiological integrity, the things that keep a patient alive, along with airway, breathing, circulation, nutrition, glucose is what? Sleep. You need sleep in order to physiologically stay alive. So that's going to be a priority as well imbalanced nutrition because of decreased appetite, constipation. Why would they be constipated? They're not drinking fluids. They're not moving, which means their GI tract has decreased, has slowed down. Yeah, they're going to be constipated. Sexual dysfunction. They have no urge for sexual activity. How about table 14.3? You see what I wrote there? No, with three exclamation marks. So you better know this. All right, so this says guidelines for communication with severely withdrawn persons. When a patient is silent, use the technique of making observations. Just observe what you see. Here's an example. There are many new pictures on the wall. Or you can say, you're wearing your new shoes. Give them an opportunity just by making that observation even if they reply with one word, they say yes. That's a dialogue, that's a beginning of a dialogue, okay? You want to use simple, concrete words. Because this patient is severely depressed, remember their cognitive functioning has gone down. So they cannot process complex uh, directions or words, okay? So you have to use, be very direct and use simple wording with them because their cognitive function has decreased for that time being. Allow the patient time to respond. If you make an observation or you ask them a question, don't follow it up with another statement. Sit there and be quiet. Give them time to formulate a thought and they're going to need time to formulate thoughts. Why? Because the cogn cognitive function has slowed down. Listen for covert messages and ask questions about suicide plans. What do I mean by covert messages? A message such as a patient saying something like, the end is almost over, or my suffering will end soon. What? Well, what do you mean by that? Avoid platitudes. Avoid catchphrases, things like, oh, things are going to look up soon, or keep your head up. Table 14-4, guidelines for counseling people with depression. I'm not gonna go over them, but I'm gonna go over the most important things that I want you to draw from this. So let's look at this interve intervention. It says, work with the patient to identify cognitive distortions that result in a negative self-perception. So you're gonna work with that patient, those thought processes that they have that keeps making them think negatively about themselves. Because remember, depression is anger hostility, resentment, negative feelings towards self, negative thoughts,
for itself. So you're going to help them resolve and work through those negative thoughts that they have about them, their own selves. And remember, those negative thoughts about themselves are distortions. What is a distortion? Something that, something that, um, what's the word? I'm, deviates from reality. It's not the truth. Okay. So what are some examples? Overgeneralizations. So ex that patient does one thing wrong and they'll, they'll say, oh, I can't do anything wrong. Well, they're overgeneralizing. You just did one thing wrong and guess what? You're human, right? Self-blaming. And I put a st star next to this because that's what seems to pop up most on test questions. It's for nursing. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Then blaming themselves for everything that goes wrong, even things that are out of their control, right? So you want to help them explore that, something that was truly out of their control. How is this their, their fault? Mind reading. They think that, or they feel like they can meet, think, read people's minds as far as, for example, you're the nurse and they'll feel like, you know, I know you think I'm dumb. I know that you know that I'm a loser. You know, there's no evidence, they have no evidence at all, but they believe that they know other people are thinking how dumb they are, how horrible they are. Nobody likes them. Nobody wants to be around them. That's the mind reading. Discounting of positive attributes. They may be a good artist and you compliment them on their artwork. Oh, this is nothing. Anyone can do that. You want to help them identify their current coping skills and explore alternate coping skills. Encourage exercise. Guess what? Them moving about, that is going to release endorphins. It's going to help them start to feel better. So encourage exercise such as running and or weightlifting. Encourage formation of supportive relationships such as individual therapy, support groups, and peer support. So that's very important. Make sure you guys know about those interventions. Table uh, 14.5, this as well. You see what I put? No, with three exclamation marks, very important. You have to know these inter um, interventions for those patients that are in vegetative states, which means they're not moving. They're not even getting up to brush your teeth, comb their hair, nothing. That's how severely depressed that they are. So let's go over these nursing interventions. For nutrition, they're going to have anorexia. They're not going to have um, any appetite to eat. What are you going to do? Offer small, high calorie, high protein snacks. Why? Because they're not ingesting that much food. So the little bit of food that they do take in needs to be high in nutrition. Okay. High in protein. Remember, protein is very good for regeneration re, um, of cells, very good for healing, wound healing. You're going to offer high protein and high calorie fluids. Include the patient in choosing food and drinks. This is important because remember, I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. You have to help them understand that they have value. So something as simple as allowing them to choose what they want to eat or drink, that gives them value, right? They're making a decision. But remember, they're so depressed, they're in a vegetative state. It can't be an open-ended question such as, what do you want to drink? Uh-uh. Because remember, their cognitive function has decreased severely. It'll take them a million years to even decide what they want to drink. And then they'll feel worse about themselves because they'll say, what's wrong with me? Everyone can choose their drink. Why can't I? You're going to make the situation worse. So what you do is offer them two choices. Would you like, I shouldn't say Coke, or Pepsi because those aren't really healthy, but you can say, would you like apple juice or orange juice? You give them two choices to choose from. So that way you're helping to increase their self-esteem while not overwhelming them with all of the choices that they would have to choose from. Um, also, you're going to weigh them weekly and observe for, for their eating patterns. This is very important. Remember guys, nutrition is a part of physiologic integrity. Let's keep going. For sleep, you're going to provide periods of rest after activities. It could be a simple activity as playing cards with 
the patient or maybe them going to group therapy. But remember, they are severely depressed. So what can seem like something very small and minute to us is a big deal to them. And you have to provide rest afterwards. Encourage them to get up and get dressed and to stay out of bed during the day. And that's gonna help them to be able to sleep through the night. Provide decaffeinated coffee and soda. They don't need any caffeine. They're already not getting enough sleep. When it comes to self-care deficits, them not combing their hair, brushing their teeth, taking a shower, do doing those regular hygiene measures and activities of daily li living. Encourage them to use a toothbrush, washcloth, soap, makeup, shaving supplies. They'll start to feel better about themselves. Encourage hygiene. When it comes to elimination, primarily constipation, because remember, they're not moving much, they're not drinking fluids, they're really not eating much. Yeah. Chances are high, they're gonna be constipated. You're going to monitor their I and O, okay? Especially the bowel movements. Provide um, periods of exercise because remember, as they're moving, guess what increases? Peristalsis. Don't get thirsty with the exercise, drink more, right? You're gonna encourage intake of fluids and evaluate the need for laxatives and enemas. We don't want to give laxatives and enemas. We try to go with the least invasive measure possible, but sometimes it's necessary. So you're gonna still have to assess the patient for the need for them, okay? All right, guys, part three, I'm going to start on the antidepressive drugs. This is where we're gonna start with part three. And just something I want you guys to keep in mind, when it comes to the um, antidepressant medications, our number one go-to class of drugs for antidepressants are the SSRIs. They have the least amount of adverse effects and they tend to be the most effective. However, there are other classes if the SSRIs are not doing the drug are not doing the job that we go to. So I'm going to be covering all of these medications. That's going to be part three of depression. If you haven't seen my video that I did on um, anti-depression drugs. That's actually in my pharmacology playlist, but I think I added it to my psych playlist as well. Watch that as well. It's very informative. And I'm going to also be touching up on this in part three. So guys in the comment section, please let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover. Please if you're interested in supporting my channel, the best way you can support my channel is by engaging with me in the comment section, sharing my videos on your social media platforms such as Instagram and Facebook, and of course, checking out my audio lesson and possibly purchasing a lesson or two on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Don't forget, you guys can see me cover a variety of questions almost daily on my other social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will see me on the next video.